Good morning, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day, for the rain that is refreshed to the earth, the warm sunshine which warms our bodies. And Lord, as we come into your house today, we are so thankful for our living God. We come, Lord, yes, indeed, silent before you, silent in the fact that we have closed our minds to all things that would distract us. Lord, we have put away all things that would keep us from being in close and intimate contact with you. Dear Lord, our hearts are open, our thoughts are open, our eyes are open, our ears are open, and we want you to speak to us, Lord, this day. We want you to anoint us with your Holy Spirit. We want to hear the voice of God and the guidance of the Spirit within us this morning. So, Lord, happy Sabbath. Thank you for your blessings. We praise you. We love you. We honor you. And we come together, though we're not here in body, we are here together in spirit, Lord, as we worship you together today, as we reach out to take the hand of our Christ and to be refreshed. May glory and honor be to your holy name, O Lord, for on our, in our hearts and on our lips we sing you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Nice to uh, be here with you this morning. And all those who are listening in, it's good to be in God's house. At least I'm in God's house. And, you know, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, there he will be in our midst. And even when we're alone, that means there's two or three because the Holy Spirit is there and Jesus is there and we are there. So we have it all every time. So it's good to be together as a family in Christ this morning. I'd like to share with you this morning a, a, a psalm of worship, Psalm 138. It's entitled, The Lord's Goodness to the Faithful, and is a psalm of David. Lord, be honored in our words. I will praise you with my whole heart. For for the gods I will sing praises to you, O Lord. I will worship toward your holy temple. I will praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me, and you made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Wow, what a beautiful song of praise this morning as we lift up our hearts and our voices to our God and give him worship, give him honor, and give him glory. Good morning again. It's so good to be together and to worship our God. Before we uh, go to our uh, pastoral prayer this morning, I do have a couple of announcements I would like to bring to your attention. First of all, greetings to everyone. I trust you are well. I trust God is blessing you. And even if you are not as well as you might be, God is still blessing you, and God is still watching over you. I want to invite you to continue to pray for your church family and for each uh, one of those who are watching, as well as for our families, our communities, and those around us. You know, I know it's a little bit uh, tight for us because we're sort of quarantined, but you know, I have found and seen many ways to bless those, our neighbors, and those around us, the vendors in our, in our community, by you know, trying to uh, you know, take out of whatever and try to give them some encouragement. And so be on the phone. Uh, you don't have to be close, but you can still talk to your neighbors and encourage them. So take the time to be a blessing to one another and to your neighborhood as well. Secondly, I just want to remind you, this is the Memorial Day weekend. It's a big weekend. It's a, it's a time of festivity and, and holidaying, it seems. But it's a time that we are to, should take some moments to pull aside and reflect reflect upon the great sacrifice that has been made for the greatness and the freedom of our nation. It's not perfect by any means, and we know things aren't always going to go well, but a lot of uh, 
a lot of suffering and a lot of energy and a lot of time has taken place and been given so that we can have the nation that we have. And so let's remember um, our vets, let's remember those who have gone before and those who have sacrificed. Let's remember the families who still grieve because currently um, folks are offering up their lives and so forth for our nation and for our freedom. So please keep them in your prayers and be grateful to God. And while you're doing that, let's not forget our own Christian heritage. I'll tell you, the, the, the road to today has been paved with a great deal of sacrifice and blood as well. God's people who have lived faithfully and died faithfully to preserve the kingdom of God. So on this Memorial Day, it would be appropriate that we remember that as well and keep that in our minds and be thankful to God and ask him that each one of us will have the courage to be strong in Christ and to be willing to give whatever it requires for the advancement of his cause and for the kingdom of Christ. May God bless us on this weekend as we do that. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. Continue to send those in. And uh, may God continue to uh, bless us through the week. I'd like to take a few moments now to um, <clears throat> take, uh, take some time to pray together. We will uh, be remembering your loved ones, those who are struggling. And although we can't take requests here, uh, I would ask you to bring your requests before the Lord, and uh, he sees, he hears, he knows. It's his spirit which brings us all together, and we will uh, lift those concerns and prayers up to our God. Let us uh, kneel together as we pray. <clears throat> Our beloved God and Heavenly Father, how thankful, Lord, we are to come together on our knees to acknowledge with humility and with appreciation your wonderful love and magnificent grace toward us. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are so blessed as a people, those who claim the name of Jesus those who um, have depended upon your word and upon your promises. Dear Lord, those who have embraced faith in you as their God and their Savior, Lord, we are so blessed because you watch over us. Heavenly Father, through crises like these, you, you keep us in the palm of your hand. And through other kinds of crises that we face every day, health crises or issues with uh, our finances, which is a really big deal right now in so many places and of so many families. Heavenly Father, as we face suffering and death and illness, as we face the loss of loved ones and friends, dear Lord, we are just so thankful that we can, can come and sit beside you as you put your hand around us and, and speak words of comfort and strength. You remind us of those, those texts and those promises which says, Lo, you are with us always. Be not afraid, for I am thy God. And no matter what our circumstances, Lord, as the psalmist has said, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Dear Lord, thank you for being so faithful to us. Thank you for your goodness and for your grace. And as we pray together this morning, we lift up our individual requests and concerns our prayers of thanksgiving and praise for all the ways you have blessed us and refreshed us and kept us safe. Dear Lord, we, we lift our hands and our hearts to you with great gratitude because you are faithful, dear Lord. You are faithful to us. And you, you, you keep your promises and you reveal your, your great power in our lives. And Lord, we are so thankful for that. And so Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, accept our praise. Uh, anoint, <coughs> anoint us and anoint your word that as it touches our hearts, dear Lord, it will do its work of revitalization and reformation. Dear Lord, will remind us that we need not be afraid <coughs> and that we can trust you and therefore we can be faithful. And Lord, we can be courageous. And Heavenly Father, we can be at peace. So may the peace of Christ and the loving kindness of his grace be upon us. Dear Heavenly Father, accept our, our adoration and our joy. For Heavenly Father, the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. And for that strength, we thank you this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, 
I trust you have been um, studying your Sabbath school lesson and things during the week and been keeping your eyes on developments uh, all around. It's been an interesting journey <laughs> through all of this, but be patient. Things are beginning to uh, change and open up, and that's good. I'd like to uh, have you turn in your word again today to um, the book of, uh, of Acts, chapter 16, as we uh, continue on the uh, study that we began last week entitled, When God Prepares the Way. When God Prepares the Way. I'm going to do a little bit of um, opening here. I'm going to kind of reflect a little bit um, about last week, and then we will continue on. Uh, I have found this uh, even an incredible study myself and, and quite interesting, and I, I hope you have found it exciting as well. But first of all, I want to, uh, let's read uh, verses 7 to 10 today. Acts chapter 16, verses 7 through 10. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, in concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel, preach the gospel to them. You know, um, the, this, is a, this is a magnificent story about um, outreach and evangelism. It is about uh, calling as our, as our mission as a church. But I want to share as we, we go with this, because this calling here is very interesting. This, this, this calling by this man from Macedonia, come, come, come to us, come to help us. And I want to remind us, we live in the same kind of a world that, that Christianity was in at the time of the disciples. Uh, many of the same dynamics, many of the same kinds of challenges uh, were facing them. They had a, a globalized uh, kind of uh, economy as well as a globalized uh, social structure. They had uh, resistances of uh, materialism that were, were powerful in those days. They had multitudes of, of pagan religions to, to combat and to deal with. And they had a, a powerful force of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, let's see, see Satanism and um, and uh, the, the, the workings of, of the evil one were, were very rampant and present in their day. And when I think about their day and I think about the things that we face as a church, it is, the, is very much the same. It is a daunting, daunting kind of a task for us. But the thing that's marvelous about this story is, is that the, the disciples did not pull back from that. They just charged forward with the guidance of God. And he opened up the way for them to break through this, through the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, etc. And so as we talk about this, I just want to read this song. I don't know where I got this song. It's an old song. In fact, I don't even know the tune. I actually made up a tune last night for it. But listen to the words. It's very, it's very uh, compelling. It says, The vision of a dying world is vast before our eyes. We feel the heartbeat of its need. We hear its feeble cries. Lord Jesus Christ, revive thy church in this her crucial hour. Lord Jesus Christ, awake thy church with spirit-given power. The savage hugs his god of stone and fears descent of night. The city dweller cries alone amid the garish light. Lord Jesus Christ, arouse thy church to see their mute distress. Lord Jesus Christ, equip thy church with love and tenderness. Today, as understanding bounds are stretched on every hand, O oh, clothe thy word in bright new sounds, and speed it o'er the land. Lord Jesus Christ, empower us to preach by every means. Lord Jesus Christ, embolden us in the near and distant scenes. The warning bell of judgment tolls, above us looms the cross. Around us are every dying soul. How great, how great the loss. O Lord, constrain and move thy church, the glad news to impart. And Lord, as thou dost stir thy church, begin within my heart. 
that needs to be the cry of every soul today because the Lord is saying, come, you know, given his visions, come, go into the world, go to Macedonia, face the onslaught. I prepared the way and God is preparing the way for a great and closing final message. And we need to take this song to heart because it's not about me telling you. <laughs> It's not about you telling others. It's not about me preaching about it. I've got to be on my knees and say, Lord, give me this passion of heart. It starts with each one of us. <clears throat> so this is what this, <laughs> I think that this is really about, this whole thing. I just want to review uh, the story a little bit. Last week we talked about Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke going um, into Asia Minor wanting to, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And as they got near there, the Holy Spirit came to them and he says, no, I don't want you going there. That's the first part of this, uh, this chapter. I don't want you going there. So they plan to go kind of someplace else. No, I don't want you to go there. And then Paul had a vision of this man beckoning them, come and help us here in Macedonia. And that's the way they did. They, they listened to the Spirit. They went and they, they searched out a place. They went to the city of Philippi, finally the biggest center that was there. And another thing about this story, it gives us a blueprint of how to go about doing our evangelistic work. And it's interesting, Paul found a, the, a large city. Um, he found a place where there were a lot of people, where he found a place where it was kind of a hub. He found a place where people could hear the gospel and perhaps go other places, but he couldn't find a synagogue there like he normally does. So as his, they, he went around looking for a place of prayer, I'm sure he's heard that there were some Jewish women down by the river to pray on Sabbath. So he found himself there, began to talk to them, began to fellowship with them, began to pray with them, and finally had an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And there's a, a lovely woman there named Lydia, probably a fairly wealthy woman there, seller of purple. She had her own business. And she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal savior, invited her family to do the same. And there he won a whole family to Christ. What a beautiful picture. God was leading the way. And as the Bible is very specific about that because it doesn't say that Paul brought her to Christ. It says the Spirit touched her heart and brought her to the message of Paul. That's the way it is with us. Sometimes we get the idea that it's we who bring people to Christ. It is not. God uses us as tools to share our testimony and share what we have, but it's the Holy Spirit that convicts the heart. And that's what we need to be praying about all the time praying that the Spirit will lead us and that we will have a voice, a voice to be, um, uh, that we will hear his voice. Um, just a, a couple of points I want us to look at at the beginning of this again. I believe that the work that is before us in terms of the gospel is staggering. But I think that God has a plan. And I'm convicted as God who sets the stage and helps us to complete his work. But there's three things, again, I want to emphasize as we look at this story again that I want you to remember. First of all, this story talks about embracing our calling and being about our Lord's business. You know, we, we all don't have big ministries necessarily. We're all individuals. We all have individual talents. But everybody can do something. Everybody can play a part and be about God's business as the Holy Spirit leads each one of us. That we need to do, and God will use that. Secondly... This story is talking about being much in prayer and learning to listen and to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned last week, we do a lot of things. We, we talk, we preach, we do a lot of teaching. But I don't think we are in our knees actually often enough. We need to be praying more. We need to be praying in groups more. We need to be praying on the phone more. We need to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and praying that he will be clear and guide us and let us know exactly where, how, and where he wants us to work. Yes, we have the word, and yes, we have counsel, but nonetheless, that's, that's not enough. In our, in our human framework, as wise as we are, we're not that wise. As much talent as we might have, it is only God who knows the heart. It is God who leads us to the places where he is working. It is the Holy Spirit which convicts people around us, and if we're not really closely in touch with the Holy Spirit, we won't know where God is working. It may be in our families. It may be next door. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. <laughs> it may be um, a lot of different places. But uh, unless we are in touch with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says, yeah, I want you to talk to this one today. You ever had that experience with the Holy Spirit sometime where you're just sort of in a, in a room or you're just someplace, and, and, and you don't maybe, maybe know a person, but something prompts you that says, talk to that person. <laughs> you ever had that happen? Or just say hello. 
or just engage them. And you say, wow, that's kind of weird. I don't even know who they are. But you do it. And after you've done it, you find out, oh, this person's kind of friendly. You start a little conversation. And you're able to do something incredibly significant in their life, even if it's a word of encouragement and strength. That just happened to me one time. First, we were just in an elevator or something. They said, hello. I said, hi, how are you doing? Uh, you know, I, I said it just like, you know, you can say, hey, how you doing? You know, you can just kind of like, uh, you know, just be polite. I said, yeah. And I just looked at it. I said, yeah, how, how you doing? And they, they kind of got quiet for a minute. I says, um, kind of took a little hint from that. I says, uh, day not going so good? I says, no, nah, I'm really having a hard day. Is that an invitation? Yeah, it's an invitation, isn't it? So you say, well, you know, you don't start talking. You just start saying, uh, uh, what's going on? Um, what's happening? And a lot of times they'll open up and begin to talk to you and, and encourage a little bit. And, and, and when you get done, you might want to walk off the elevator with them. Or you might want to just take a few moments. I've had opportunities to pray with people in those situations or just say, you know, it, it's really a tough day, but, you know, I'll be praying for you. Some people don't want you to pray right there, but I'll be praying for you. I'll be encouraging you or give them a word of encouragement. We won't know until eternity how far that goes. And there are people all around you every day where God is working in their hearts. And if we are in tune with the Spirit, he will plant us there in order to be a vessel in his hand to bless that person. But we've got to be praying. We've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. So that's an important part of this story. Also, the third part. <coughs> excuse me just a minute. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, it says, entrust your path and circumstances to God. And though things may go rough or difficult, God has a plan and great things will unfold. And that is so true. In this story that we're looking at today, things got kind of rough at first. As Paul brought to Lydia to, to, um, to the church or into, uh, into the fold of grace, they continued to meet in prayer by the river. And while Paul was preaching and teaching there or whatever, um, he, was, he, was, um, he was visited by another young woman who is told is demon-possessed. <laughs> demon-possessed. Kind of interesting. I want you to notice something here, is that the ministry of Paul and Silas and Timothy and all these folks was now getting ready to go viral. I'm using that word because that's one of our words today, you know? Things go viral, it gets on the internet, it goes every place. You say, well, how does it go viral? Well, you just watch. And this is where I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reminding you, you know, this is God's program and God's work. And that's the reason for my sermon, when God prepares the way. Now, he doesn't always prepare all the downsides of things that happen, but he will use them to his benefit. And I think he's pre-planned to make it work. And so you watch how this thing goes viral. So the woman starts up. Um, starts uh, following Paul and Silas and all them who are preaching. And of course it says that uh, she begins to, to say things about who they are, that they are you know, servants of the, of the true high God, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is she's a devil possessed, and so it's, the message is kind of a mixed message. It's a true message, <laughs> but, the, but the source is not a true source, and so there's a lot of reason for misunderstanding. And she followed him, I guess, day after day after day after day, keeps saying this over and over and over and over again. Finally, the Bible says, Paul got a little tired of it, okay? He getting irritated with this thing. So he turned around and says, come out of her. Spirit, come out of her. And boom. <laughs> it says within that hour, the evil spirit came out of this woman. And uh, here she was left whole and complete, free. But it didn't go too well. It didn't go too well because she was making money for her benefactor. So what happens, they complain to the magistrates, whatever, whatever, the crowd gathers, they take them to the square, and they get themselves beat with rods and finally thrown in prison. But I wanna go, I wanna divert from here for just a minute, if we could, and take a look at another story that's uh, pretty interesting as it relates to this. You know, in the, in the days of Jesus, we had a similar kind of uh, situation take place. And I wanna look at that for just a minute. Let's go to um, Mark chapter 1 for just a second, and um, <clears throat> verses 21 to 28. Very interesting story, because it reminds me of this story and similar outcomes for that. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. 
Then they went into, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and he taught. And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you not come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Wow. How would you like to have that happen in the church service some morning? <laughs> that would be really interesting. One of my instructors in um, seminary had that experience one time. I don't know if I told you that story or not, but he was preaching an evangelistic series, like and talking about uh, the, the, the authority of the scriptures. And right in the middle of the sermon, he was in this big tent meeting, okay? Hundreds of people were there. And right in the middle of the service, this, uh, this woman stood up. I'm good. You got me all right. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. My congregation is helping me here this morning. <laughs> anyway, the woman stood up and started speaking in tongues, started speaking in tongues. And, and, and my, uh, my, my pastor and evangelist teacher said, uh, uh, you know, he didn't do this up front, but you know what's going on in his head. Man, how do I deal with this? And so he, he quickly sent up a prayer and says, Lord, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? And so the text immediately came to his head. You know which text it was? What do you think a text it would be? Um, the text that came to his head was the one, if they speak not according to this word, because there's no light in them, right? So immediately he, he quoted that text uh, from the scriptures, and that speaking in tongues was immediately turned into English. And when it turned into English, it turned into swearing and cursing and all kinds of ugly language right there in the middle of the service. <laughs> Well, once that happened, of course, everybody knew what was going on, and they finally had to, you know, usher the person out. But he's in an area where there's a lot of spiritualism and things going on in, in that region. And so here we have that right in the middle of the service, Jesus is teaching, and here this demon-possessed man stands up and challenges Jesus. We know who you are. They didn't know who he was. <laughs> but the, the important thing is that's really interesting here is, is, is Jesus' response, Okay. Uh, let's go back here to verse 25. <clears throat> but Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For the authority he, to, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. Aha! Almost the same kind of story, isn't it? It's very interesting. And so we have this going on here. I want to read something to you as well from the, um, the book uh, uh, Desire of Ages on this. It's found on page 256. I want you to take note of this because remember when I said that, that the challenges we face today are just like the challenges that the early church faced in the time of Jesus and the early church. And we know that one of the things that we face is, a, is, is the power of spiritualism, don't we? We know that that's going to be a, a major event that we need to deal with, that we have to confront. And, and we see it all around us all the time. But there's a couple aspects of that we need to re keep in mind. Listen to this. I'm just going to read a few little sections. It says, He, Jesus, had conquered the spirit in the wilderness of temptation, was about to face, to, it was about to be brought face to face with his enemy. The demon exerted all his power, all his power to retain control of his victim. To lose ground here would to give victory to Jesus. It seemed that the torture man must lose his life in the struggle with the foe that had been the ruin of his manhood. He goes on to talk about his life and how he got to this place. What a poor soul this was. He was, he was, he was totally under the control of his passions, totally under the control of, of, of the demons that were within him. And it was horrible. And Jesus saw the struggle that was going on. The man who had been... Um, I'm sorry, it seemed that the tortured man must lose his life in the struggle with the foe that had been the ruin of his manhood. But the Savior spoke with authority and set the captive free. The man who had been possessed 
stood before the wondering people, happy in the freedom of self-possession. Even the demon had testified to the divine power of the Savior. The man praised God for his deliverance. The eye that had so lately glared with the fire of insanity now beamed with intelligence and overflowed with grateful tears. The people were dumb with amazement, and as soon as they recovered speech, they exclaimed one to another, what is this? Now, there's a, at the end of this page, there's an amazing statement that I want us to pay attention to because we're working on a couple different levels here as, as we as God's people go forth into the world to deal with the issues of the last day and prepare for the coming of Jesus, okay? This is what we're called to do. It is this environment in which we work. But it is God who has the power. It is God who has the plan. It is God who is going to conquer the enemy. It is God that's going to give victory. It is God that's going to proclaim his name. It is God who's going to be glorified. And it is God is going to let the world know who God is and who God isn't. You need to keep that in mind. Listen to this. This is really pretty, pretty frightening. The same evil spirit that tempted Christ in the wilderness and that possessed the maniac of Capernaum controlled the unbelieving Jews. Woo. That's something to think about, isn't it? But with them, he assumed an air of piety seeking to deceive them as to their motives in rejecting the Savior. You see the difference? One was a maniac. One was spiritual self-righteousness and theological correctness, right? Wow. There can be, now, this is the thing that's really, really frightening. Listen to this. Their condition was more hopeless than that of the demoniac. That's what we're dealing with in the end, isn't it? We're dealing with fallen Babylon who thinks it is connected to God and isn't and has all kinds of rationales to prove their authority, and they have none. It's a time of deception. It's a time of, of, of great spiritual decline and darkness. But in the darkness, it is believed to be light. She goes on to say, I'm going to say it one more time. Their condition was more hopeless than that of the demoniac, for they felt no need of Christ and were therefore held fast under the power of Satan. Whoa! Man, that's powerful. We have the same thing here in Acts chapter 16. As, as Paul and the, the disciples had entered Philippi, we have the same conflict. We have the same battle. The leaders and the people are, going, are, 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 are false worshipers. They're, 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 they're being led, even though they don't know it, to follow the dictates of the evil one. And Paul and Silas have stepped into the middle of the battle. And immediately, as they face the, as they, as they face the enemy, as they face the enemy, what happens? Satan goes after them, Right? They deliver a man. They think that they would be happy to see this, this, this woman in her right mind and, and in peace. We'll talk about that a little bit. In her right mind and peace. But instead, all they can see is that their financial gain is gone. And Satan says, I'm going to get you. And he goes after him right away, right? Now, Maurice here today, you asked me a question last week. How come they only took uh, Paul and Silas um, and beat them? Because they didn't beat uh, Timothy or Luke. You know, I just, I just scratched my head over that just a little bit. And I, I gave you an answer last week, and I think it was a good one, but maybe it wasn't the best answer. You know why I think it was? Because something happens later that God uses in a very interesting way. Remember later on as the story unfolds, they are thrown into prison, and the authorities, you know, have to kind of apologize because they were Romans. Only Paul and Silas were Romans. Think about that. Only Paul and Silas were Romans. And the two people they picked to beat <laughs> were Paul and Silas. I think God maybe had a plan in that. 
Not that he wanted to hurt them, but because they were Romans, the impact of the event was heightened a hundredfold because of the situation that would unfold. You see, even when things aren't good, God has a plan. And we've got to realize our work in the end is not going to be easy. It's going to be full of sacrifice. It's going to be full of difficulty. But press on, because no matter what happens, God has a plan. <laughs> and if you're in it, you'll only succeed. Isn't that good news? I mean, that's great news, I think. Anyway, so there it is. The devil knows that his territory has been entered. I want to go back now and pick up a little bit um, about, uh, about Paul and Silas in, in prison. You know, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. They were beaten first. They were in chains. And then, of course, we have in that situation um, a difficult time. Their backs are probably bloody. They were in stocks. Probably their feet up, upright, laying on their back on a dirty, dark, dingy floor. And then something really interesting happens, we're told, that they began to sing praises. <clears throat> sing praises. In Acts of the Apostles, and the Bible infers it as well, on page 217, Troy makes a very interesting statement. She says, a sanctifying influence diffused itself among the inmates. A sanctifying influence diffused itself among the inmates of the prison. And the minds of all were open to listen to the truths spoken by the apostles. When you look at the language of the text here about that event, it talks about them listening. That's a specific kind of word, not just listening, listening. You know, you couldn't help but listen because they're all in this room together. But it was a, it was a desired listening. It was, it was a, a sanctified experience where what they were hearing and what they were experiencing was touching them and moving them, and they desired to hear more. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. They were all open to the truth spoken by the apostles. They were convinced that the God whom these men served had miraculously released them from bondage. Here we have these men singing, okay? And it just so happens, what do you think the coincidence was that while they were singing, an earthquake hit? <laughs> uh, you know, if you're one of these, you know, Evolutionists, you think everything, you know, there's no miracles in the Bible or whatever. You say, boy, what a coincidence. That was an amazing coincidence. No coincidence. No. The God of the universe says, I'm just going to rumble this place just a little bit. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to affirm what my, what my men are saying in prison. They're singing about me. They're talking about me. The hearts of these guys are listening. And I know how to kind of lay that a little bit firm, deeper with some evidence. And so, now uh, uh, earthquake rumbled. And in the process of the rumbling, the gates were thrown open, and the men were released. Well, um, normally prisoners would run for their lives, right? They'd try to get out of that place. Well, the guard was sleeping, the jailer. And when he woke up and he saw the door open and darkness in there, he was sure he was a dead man. They were all gone. But no. Paul and Silas, in that reassuring voice, says, Sir, do, you know, do yourself no harm. We are all here. Now there's a miracle. I'm telling you, there is a miracle. Powerful miracle. All of these men in the prison were touched by the, by the words and the singing of Paul and Silas. The jailer was touched by the singing of Paul and Silas. How do we know that the jailer was touched too? Because he rushed in with the light and he fell at the feet of Paul and Silas. He says, what do I need to do to be saved? Wow. Now, that's probably, that's a pretty significant evangelistic experience there, isn't it? 
I mean, here they're, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison, they're sitting there in pain, they're singing praises to God, and you got all these prisoners are being touched by this, uh, just by their, 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 their singing, and the jailer's listening to that, and here they are still probably, you know, kind of there, maybe sitting up now, but still in the, in the dark room. He comes running and puts his lamp down, kneels before them and says, what must I do to be saved? Praise God! <laughs> what an event! It was amazing, it was amazing. God's at work. God's at work. Well, I guess the jailer should carry his other prisoners. You know, this is one of these Bible things I wish I could have a little bit more information on. I don't think Spirit of Prophecy says a whole lot about it. Wouldn't you like to know what happened to all those prisoners? Mm -hmm. You know, they obviously had an experience there in the jail, didn't they? They obviously had some sort of a, they were impacted by God's Holy Spirit, weren't they? Yeah. I wonder what happened to them after that. I'd like to, I'd like to know the rest of the story, wouldn't you? I wonder if the early church that was left behind sought those men out, you know? I wonder if the jailer, jailer knew who they were. I wonder if the jailer and his family sought these men out, you know, and shared some more gospel with them and prayed with them, turned their lives around brought them into the church. We don't know, but we do know one thing. The church at Philippi became one of the keystone churches of the, of the early Christian church. They were a strong church. They were a faithful church. They were a powerful church in their area for many, 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 many years. <laughs> Something special happened in Philippi. And because of Philippi, the gospel actually spread into the whole of the parts of Europe. Wouldn't it be something if the gospel hadn't gone to Europe? You know, just the history there. Anyway, so interesting. So interesting. A sanctifying influence. What they had heard, what they saw, what they saw of these men. And that's where I have to look in the mirror as I read this story. And I have to ask myself, as I move through the earth, as I move through my neighborhood, as I move through the stores and the places around me, what do people see? What do they sense? What kind of a person is revealed as I move among the world of men, women, and children? The behavior of Paul and Silas all confirmed what had been confirmed, what had already been said about them. Remember, they were locked up. Why? Because they were preaching things they shouldn't preach as Jews to the Romans. They were people of God. They were God. Uh, they were Christians or whatever the, the message was getting across. The, the, the evil spirit, remember, that was in the woman? They said, these, these are prophets or men of the most high God. Wow. I tried to live that one up, live that one down. Even though it was coming from the wrong source, yet in reality, it was true. And there were some things surrounding their reputation already as being in this community. And here as they sat in the prison, beaten and hurt, what was their message? The prisoners inside saw that who they were reported to be was truly who they were reported to be, right? Wow, how beautiful is that? How beautiful. They were, they were indeed men of God. They were indeed men of God. It was a long night for them of suffering, but as you know the story, the jailer took them out, took them home, fed them, bathed their wounds. Paul, Silas, and they preached the gospel to them, baptized the entire family. <laughs> And the jailer then takes them back to jail and puts them in jail. You know, he had to do that because they weren't released yet. So sometime during the night or the morning, he returns them to the prison or to the prison to await to see what was going to happen next. God was and had prepared what was going to happen next as well. Let's um, let's pick it up maybe here. Let's see, go back to Acts chapter 16. And we'll pick that up at, um, at verse 35. 
And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officer saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, you know, he's probably pretty excited about, it, you know, actually, ah, you guys are good, can go now. Everything's, everything's okay. Um, the magistrates have sent to you to go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly and uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now, do they put us out secretly? No way. Well, about to say no way. And he says, no, indeed. <laughs> Let them come themselves and get us out. <laughs> Paul's a bit of a scrapper, wasn't he? He was a man to be contended with, wasn't he? Yeah. Okay. So, we are Romans. That changes things all together, doesn't it? Because it was a serious offense to beat Romans, especially having beaten them without having a hearing and having had them go through the, 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 the processes of, of, of legal counsel. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Why did Paul challenge the magistrates? Was it the fact, well, I'm a Roman and I have rights. You have violated my rights and I claim my rights. Is that why you did it? Could he have done that? Of course. He had every right to, didn't he? Did he do it to justify himself? Was he worried about uh, justifying himself, saying, you know, I've been wrongly condemned, and you're going to make this right. Is that it? Uh, was it a chance to get one over on them and to humiliate them? Certainly a possibility. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of that going on in our country today, don't we? You know? You messed up and the whole world's going to know it and we're going to destroy you if we can, right? It's a horrible spirit in the land today. Divisive. Resentful. Getting even. Bitter. Destruction. If I don't like you, I'm going to destroy you. It's satanic and evil. You need to pray hard. Well, let's see. How about to flex his own muscles to make his own point? Could have done that too, couldn't he? What do you think? Anybody want to suggest? We got a couple of thoughts here. I have you suggest out there. Maybe if you get on my phone and have a, you can dial in and give me some answers. <laughs> Think that through. The what? To establish the validity of their work? Yeah, yeah, I think we're getting closer here. How did this opportunity give or provide an opportunity to advance the work of God? That's the question. How did this opportunity provide a chance to advance the work of God? That's really the question, isn't it? That's the only question. God is in charge. This is part of the dynamic. And with the part of the dynamic, why did Paul go this way? Do you think Paul had a vision? Do you think Paul and Silas were praying in the prison? I think they were. I don't know if we had a vision or not, but when it came clear that they were just going to let them go in peace, I think Paul realized, I think the Holy Spirit gave them the opportunity to say, no, wait a minute. I can use this. Here's what I want you to do. <laughs> um, so let's go on and keep reading just a little bit more here as we uh, try to finish up here today. Um, all right, here we go. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly and uncondemned, Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid, rightfully so. <laughs> when they heard that they were Romans, then they came and, what is the word you have in your Bible there? Something like King James, besought besieged, some of, this, um, some of them are pleaded, <laughs> pleaded, that's a good word for this uh, Greek word, they pleaded with them, in fact, it's, it, it, it has the, the idea of apology, besought, entreat, and apologize, that's the connotation of this word, they came to these men and really humbled themselves before them and sought their apology, they, and, and then they said, 
Then they came and pleaded with them and besought them, uh, or brought them out and asked them, please depart from our city. Depart from our city. There's a whole different attitude now among these magistrates, wasn't there? There's a humbleness, a humility that now took over. Paul had them at a point of great vulnerability. Incredible vulnerability. It's interesting. And they could have made a big, big deal out of that. They really could have. But what do they do? In the commentary it says the word there, they feared with great reason for wrongful punishment of a Roman citizen could have caused the magistrates removal, degradation, and inability to hold other positions of responsibility. <laughs> this explains their over solicitous efforts to find a quiet solution to their predicament. A plea of ignorance of the victim's citizenship <laughs> would not have been enough. Okay, what would you have done? What would you have done? Paul was sure of the fact that the magistrates understood the magnitude of their error. And from fear, fear, fear of what? Well, they knew what these men were supposed, who these men were supposed to be. These magistrates knew the story about Paul and their preaching. These men knew about what the Spirit had said about who they were. And not only that, but the night before, there was an earthquake. The jail was open. And I think they knew the story about the men not leaving, and about the jailer, and about all the rest. There is a true divine fear that settled upon these men as they came to Paul and Silas. They humbled themselves, and Paul demonstrated a spirit of grace and a magnanimous spirit by not pursuing the matter and simply by leaving the city. Again, he was showing to the magistrates the kind of people Gracious, forgiving, solicitous, you know, and humble. Why did they do that? Well, I think that's just who they were. But it was going to leave a message for the soon-to-grow fledgling church, right? Yes. And as that church began to grow, and as that church began to minister, and as a word about that church and their experience began to get around the community, what kind of message was it about who these people were? Were these, were these troublers? Were these Jews that had come in to upset the community? Were these people that, that would need to be feared and punished and jailed? No! No! They were people of quality, people of grace, people of strength and power, people of God. Their message was power. By not pursuing the matter and leaving the city, say a true testimony to the kind of people the officials were dealing with. Christians, citizens of the kingdom of God, not seekers of revenge, not seekers of retribution, not seekers of, of power or position, but persons of grace, kindness, and respect. They wanted to secure and ensure a better attitude and atmosphere for the fledging church. He sought to bring glory to God and advance his kingdom and his message. And they quietly agreed to leave. They went by Lydia's house. They met whatever brethren were there. And remember, there, was our, there are a few more now than there was when they came, right? First we have Lydia and her family. And then we have probably the young woman out of which the, the demon was, was removed. And I don't know about her family, but we have, I'm sure they were pretty grateful. And then we have the jailer and his family. 
And we might have a few of the, uh, the prisoners, though. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Anybody else that might have been around or here in the preaching. And I don't know about the women at, women at the, the, the river. Remember all them who are gathering to pray? There may be a few more in that group. But Paul encouraged them. He probably prayed for them. He left behind Timothy and, and Luke. And, and they built a very, very powerful church there. And they quietly went on their own. Wow, pretty neat, isn't it? Next, the Apostles, page 218 and 19. I want to share something with you. I have to read this myself carefully and have to think about this. And in the context of the story, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. You might want to read this account in, the, in Acts of the Apostles. It's a pretty interesting little story. Listen to this. The apostles did not regard as in vain their labors in Philippi. They had met much opposition and persecution. But the intervention of providence in their behalf and the conversion of the jailer and his household more than atoned for the disgrace and suffering that they had endured. Really small potatoes when you look at it. That's a lot of suffering for just a family. No, it's not. Jesus would have died for one person. Every gain is worth the effort. It really is. Let's go on. The news of their unjust imprisonment and miraculous deliverance became known through all that region. Remember I said it was going to go viral? There it is. Whole region. <laughs> And this brought the work of the apostles to the notice of a large number who otherwise would not have been reached. I love that. Paul's labors in Philippi resulted in the establishment of a church whose membership steadily increased. His zeal and devotion, and above all, his willingness to suffer for Christ's sake, exerted a deep and lasting influence upon the converts. They prized the precious truths for which the apostles had sacrificed so much and gave themselves with wholehearted devotion to the cause of their Redeemer. Now, hear this as I close. Terrible is the struggle that takes place between the forces of good and of evil in important centers where the messengers of truth are called upon to labor. Did you hear that? Terrible is the struggle that takes place between the forces of good and of evil in the important centers where the messengers of truth are called to labor. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, declares Paul, but against principalities, against powers, against the powers of darkness of this world. Till the close of time, there will be conflict between the church of God and those who are under the control of evil angels. It is a given. Resistance is a given. Struggle is a given. It's just what it is. It will always be that way. It has always been that way. But God has the power to break through. That's the point. God has a plan, and the Holy Spirit can break through. Holy Spirit can deliver. Holy Spirit can, can defeat the power of the evil one, and we need not be afraid or flee. We need to go on the offense. Or the offensive, I should say. The early Christians were often called to meet powers of darkness face to face. By sophistry and by persecution, the enemy endeavored to turn them from the true faith. Now here is the part that really hits us. At the present time, when the end of all things earthly is rapidly approaching, Satan is putting forth desperate efforts to ensnare the world. Desperate. What causes desperation? When does somebody get desperate? When they're cornered, when they're afraid. 
or when they're going to be overthrown. I love this word. Satan is putting forth desperate effort. Why is it so desperate? Because he knows that the king of the universe is going to break him. Sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. The desperate effort is to hang on to what he's got, but he's not going to. You know, many times our, in our preaching, it's always, you know, well, the forces are so great, you know, we're going to have to hide and all that stuff. No, God is going to make a last ditch stand, and it's going to be a doozy. It really is. It's going to make Satan desperate for his kingdom. That's going to be something to see. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be dirty. Probably going to be kind of bloody. It's going to be rough. But God is going to win. He's going to win, and he's going to win souls. He's going to deliver people. He's going to set people free. He's going to let Satan, he's going to put Satan on notice. You may think you're the prince of this world. <laughs> I am the king of the universe, and these are my people. Amen. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> he is devising many plans to occupy minds and to divert attention from the truths essential to salvation. In every city, his agencies are busily organizing into parties. Those who are opposed to the law of God. Boy, we see that, don't we? The arch deceiver is at work to introduce elements of confusion and rebellion. And men, men are being fired with a zeal that is not according to knowledge. Wickedness is reaching a highest, a height never before attained. And many ministers of the gospel are crying, peace and safety. Now listen. But God's faithful messengers are to go steadily forward with their work. Clothed with the panoply of heaven, they are to advance fearlessly and victoriously, never ceasing their warfare until every soul within their reach shall have received the message of truth for this time. Praise God! <laughs> That's why this story is just so marvelous. It is a story for us. It is a story of encouragement. It is a story of strength. It is, it is a story of hope. It is a story telling us we need to get out there. It doesn't matter what happens. God will prepare the way, and he will finish his work, and he will do it with great fanfare and accomplishment. The question is, are we going to be playing on the field? That's why the three points I said before are so important. We need to be consistently going about our Father's business as best we can for right now, okay? Pray a lot. Open your heart to the workings of the Holy Spirit and what he is doing. And join him. Hear, listen to the voice, like Samuel, you know? God calls him what in the night? He had to be told. <laughs> he had to be told. He had to be told. Next time the voice of you hear the voice say, what was, it, what was the answer? Was, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. We've got to have ears to hear. That only comes when we're on our knees, spending time with God and know his voice. That's our greatest need right now. And finally, finally, when God moves, move. When God says, go, go. When God says, here's where I want you, go. It may look dreary, may look bad, may look useless. It <laughs> don't matter. And when you go, the useless turns into a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> the Amen. impossible turns into success. And the broken turns into fixed. And the lost turns into saved. That's our message. That's our hope. It's our calling. God is going to win this. And we will win with him. So to close today, we're over just a little bit. Sorry, it's a late. I'd like to just close with this hymn this morning. It's hymn number. Um, let's see. I gotta get back to my original note here. Hymn number 582. It is. My mind, my memory isn't quite that good. Let's see how it comes out here. Oh yeah, that's it. 582. Could sing it, but I think I'll just read it point as we close up. Here it is. Working, O Christ, with thee, working with thee, unworthy, 
sinful weak, though we may be, are all to thee we give, for thee alone we live, and by thy grace achieve. Working. Along the city's waste, working with thee. Our eager footsteps haste, like thee to be, the poor we gather in, the outcast raised from sin, and labor souls to win, working with thee. Savior, we are weary not, working with thee. As hard as thine, our lot can never be. Our joy and comfort this, though, thy grace sufficient is. This changes toil to bliss when we're working with thee. So let us labor on, working with thee, till earth to thee be one. And from sin set free, till men from shore to shore receive thee and adore, and join us forevermore, working with thee. Dear Lord, this is our prayer this morning as we close our service. Lord, fill us with your spirit and give us that divine unction and passion to work with you to not be at rest or content until our passion for souls overcomes us. We desire, Lord, all those who are oppressed, all those who are imprisoned by sin and by the great sinner, the evil one, to be set free. We thank you for being with us. You have promised the victory is ours because the victory is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good Sabbath. We will talk to you.